Good morning, and you're very welcome to Chagas Hedgerow Week 2021. My name is Catherine Keena, Chagas Countryside Management Specialist, and this is the third year of Hedgerow Week. Last year, we were forced to go virtual, and this resulted in an enormous bank of valuable material, video clips, and joint media articles with experts on almost every aspect of hedges. So this year, we decided to build on this by having panel discussions around and using this bank of material. The topic today is the state of Ireland's hedgerows. Today's panel includes Julie Larkin, <coughs> um, who works for RPS and worked with hedgerows during her PhD research with Chagask. Shirley Clarkin, Heritage Officer with Monaghan County Council. Lillian O'Sullivan, researcher in Chagas Johnstown Castle. Mark McDowell from the Hedge Laying Association of Ireland and Alan Moore from Hedgerows Ireland. With us, we also have Parik Foley from Chagask, who will keep an eye on the questions that, and comments that you may wish to put into the chat function in, 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 Zoom, in this Zoom. And in the background, uh, making everything happen is Yvonne Maher. So good morning to everybody. Morning. The state of Ireland's hedgerows includes quantity and quality. Let's start with quantity with and a video clip from researcher Stuart Green from Chagas Gash Town. So when you're ready, Yvonne, please go. We often hear about hedgerow quality, but what about quantity? Chagas uses earth observation technologies such as satellites, drones and GIS to map the Irish agri-environment. Stuart Green explains. Uh, one of our main targets over the years has been hedgerows, uh, looking at the extent of hedgerows and the condition of hedgerows. And we can do that using satellites and air photographs to give us a map of hedgerows. And then we can use technologies like laser scanning and drones to get characteristics of individual hedgerows. Uh, over the years, we've attempted to map the estate of hedgerows uh, many times, and we've got uh, an estimate of roughly 680,000 kilometres of hedgerow in the country. Uh, that's if you have a very broad definition of hedgerow, that's everything sort of woody that grows at, on a boundary. Trees, hedgerows, broken hedgerows, relic hedgerows and so on. Um, and of course it varies enormously across the country. Um, the, co the counties around the Midlands and the border, they tend to have the highest density of hedgerows. Small fields, relatively low intensity. So counties like Cavan would be up at the top of the list in terms of the amount of hedgerows per hectare. And then maybe surprisingly, it's the counties on the western seaboard that tend to have the lowest percentage. Uh, and this is because they've got such wide areas, open upland that isn't enclosed. And of course, counties like Donegal, Galway would have a lot of uh, stone walls rather than hedgerows. Uh, the technologies we use to map hedgerows, uh, satellites and aerial photography, they look down from above. So they, they give us the footprint of the hedgerow. So we can say what the extent is nationally, what the length is. But of course, you know, hedgerows are three dimensional. So if we want to look at the volume of a hedgerow, its height, its width, its density, we need to use technologies like laser scanning and drones, which can give us that 3D model. And from that, we can determine how much biomass is in the hedgerow and then look at things like sequestration of the hedgerow uh, for carbon. So that's the quantity of hedges, um, huge amount of hedges in Ireland um, and again very clear that that includes the wide variety from the pure stock proof hedge to the kind of the the, the broken down hedge and bank, um, which in my view are obviously very important for biodiversity as well. Um, so everybody. So now, so to come back to, to a couple of experts who have done work on hedges, um, and I shall come first to Julie Larkin. So Julie, if you can turn on your camera and share, yep. uh, or turn on your camera. So Julie um, will explain her research a few years ago. She's now working on, on, on different topics. And um, just your comments on the quality of hedges, Julie, and quantity, obviously, I think that co you covered both. Yeah, yeah, I did. Um, just a very brief overview of my PhD research um, that was started there back in 2014 with Chagas. Um, I covered 
119 farms, um, intensive farms. So they were across three enterprises, dairy, beef and tillage, um, primarily in the south and the southeast of the country. Um, there's a lot of farms were based in Cork, uh, Kildare and Wexford. Um, and what I discovered was that um, in general, it's about 3% of each of these farms was given over to hedgerows, 3% of the total area, with beef farms having doing a little bit better than tillage and dairies. So beef farms had 2.93% of hedgerows, while dairy farms had uh, 2.73, and then tillage had a little bit lower at 2.67. So they're all in rounded up to about 3% hedgerows um, on each of these enterprises. And then we looked at the quality of a section of um, these farms. Uh, 92 farms in total, um, I looked at the quality of their hedgerows and that accounted uh, for 537 hedgerows in total that I got the quality of across these three enterprises um, around the country. Um, and what it basically said, the, the, the research, was that 90% of these 537 hedgerows were classed as low quality. Um, and then 1%, only 1% of these uh, hedgerows were classed as being of high quality. And I used the hedgerow appraisal system um, that was published by Fuchs et al to, uh, to get this uh, quality parameter. And then the reasons why the, these hedgerows were failing in the quality primarily was because of their ground flora being impoverished, impoverished. So there'd be very low species diversity within the hedgerow itself, within the woody, woody species and the ground flora. Um, there's herbicide use, so obviously with tillage farms, that would have been one of the big things you could herbicide use was very obvious um, within the, 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 wood, the hedgerow edge. Um, then there was a dominance of noxious weeds, such as your cleavers, your nettles, your thistles, things like that in some of the, the hedgerows as well. So that um, obviously leads to low quality. Then you've got poaching, um, so cattle or getting very up close to the cattle and other livestock getting up close to the, the, the ground, the base of the hedgerow, which leads to low quality. And you've got bank or wall degradation. So um, again, that's from, um, you could have livestock getting up into the, to the base of the hedgerow and it's leading to the degradation of the bank or the wall. And another big thing was gappiness. So you know yourselves where you might see a hedgerow where you've got a, a bit of a, a hawthorn here and then a few meters later, you've got another hawthorn. So they're not, they're not continuous. It, this hedgerow wouldn't be continuous in the, the landscape. So that would have uh, detrimental effects there for species that might commute, that would need those uh, full hedgerows to commute like bats through the landscape. So that's what, um, Basically, that's just a very brief overview of the research that I that I um, undertook and that what the findings of it. Thanks very much, Julie. That's really interesting, and I'm sure that will generate some some questions from our audience. Don't forget, you can put your questions or comments into the um, into the Q and A function on the Zoom call. Um, so I think in a similar vein, uh, Shirley Clerken, Heritage Officer with Monaghan County Council has done some very interesting work or has instigated some very interesting work. So, um, and Shirley, I, yeah, also over to you, Shirley, on your comments on the state of Ireland's hedgerows. Thanks, Catherine. Um, so this obviously is very county specific. So in County Monaghan, Drumland, Wetland, Hedgerow County, I suppose, mainly. Um, so in 2021, we surveyed with the financial assistance of the Heritage Council and Monaghan County Council, we resurveyed the hedges that we surveyed in 2010 using the hedgerow appraisal system that Julie's just spoken about there. So um, a methodology. So this is a, a decade of change, I suppose, that we're looking at here in County Monaghan. And to be frank, um, the news is very poor and um, kind of devastating, really, when we look at the figures that we've come out of the survey. So I'm just going to quickly run through those. So. Um, this records the extent and the, um, on the, and the floristic composition, the physical structure, the condition and the management of hedgerows in County Monaghan. So in 2010, we estimated based on our survey that we had 12,845 kilometres of hedges in County Monaghan. In 2010, we found that over a thousand kilometres has probably been removed since our last survey in 2010. And we did survey 108 hedgerows. So 10 kilometres, nearly 11 kilometres of hedgerows have been surveyed or have been removed in the sample squares, the 12 sample squares that we looked at since 2010. And this means that about 0.9% of hedges 
may be removed annually in County Monaghan. And this is far higher than the EPA estimate of the higher estimate that the EPA put on this of 0.3%. And the main reason, three quarters of the cases, the main reason was agriculture. And in 2021, we surveyed in the shrub layer, we found 30 species. This is five less species than in 2010. Obviously hawthorns most frequent, followed by blackthorn and holly. Tree climbers seem to be about the same. That would be kind of brambles and roses and um, honeysuckles, about the same. But for the species diversity, um, we found that 37% of the hedges were species rich. That meant they had four or more woody species, woody species. In 20, in, and in 20, sorry, in 2010, 20, I'm gonna mix up with my figures here. In 2010, 37% of our hedges were species rich. 2021, this is down to 23%. Um, we found 23 species in hedgerows, the main one being ash. 71% of the tree species in Monaghan hedges are ash, but 90% of these have ash dieback. So there's going to be a huge difficulty in Monaghan in the current, in the next tech decade to do with actual trees in hedges. Um, the ground flora, the herb species has species diversity has decreased. We've had an increase in nutrient rich hedgerows which show a lot of nutrient runoff from agriculture. So a lot more um, nutrient rich species like nettles and cleavers, for example. Slurry was found close to the base of some of our hedges, even spread on some hedges. 64% of the adjacent land use is now improved agriculture. In 2010, it was, it's up 10% since 2010. And 87.9% of our hedges are in unfavorable condition. Only 12% of the hedges in County Monaghan, which is a very important habitat type, are in favorable condition, according to our survey of 2021. And our survey was undertaken by Flynn Fernie, and it'll be published today on the Monaghan County Council website. It's just hot off the press. And um, you can see that um, there is a lot of work that needs to be done, just like Julie said, with regard to the management, the structure, the composition, and how we're looking after this very important habitat type. That's all, okay. Catherine. Thanks, Shirley. And I think I'm not sure I'm, I'm keeping half an eye on the questions there. And I'm not sure it is for you or Julie, but to talk about the system that was used. I think you both used the same one. So, Shirley, can you just comment on, on exactly how what survey methodology? And Julie, maybe you can confirm that you use the same one. Yeah, it's the habitat or it's the hedgerow habitat appraisal system was done by folks and Murray. So it was started, it was um, the initial um, methodology was done in the early not or the early 2000s, and then it was revised in 2010. Um, so in fact, 2010, we were the pilot survey for the revised system in 2010. And um, so it's a very standardized methodology that's been used throughout the county country. So it's, um, and it covers, I think, 25 different types of indicators for each stretch of hedge. So it's a very uh, repl replicable, mm -hmm. and I would say reliable uh, methodology that's being used. Yeah, and I know Neil Fuchs, who, who Mark McDowell may talk about later from the Hedge, hedge Laying Association of Ireland, was very involved there. Um, uh, himself and Anya Murray at, at the very beginning. Um, Julie, I you you just comment on your survey. Was it the exact same one? The exact yeah, same methodology. Yeah. Yes. And yeah, the hedgerow appraisal. Hedgerow appraisal. And I wonder, Shirley or Julie, could you put into the chat, um, Parag, if that's possible for us uh, the, the the name? So because people are very interested in the exact or where to get it. If one of you can, yeah. and Parag just reminded me, I'm not quite sure. I'm not seeing hands raised, Parag, but he said we're not using the hand raising function on this. Um, on this, uh, so please put questions and comments in the Q and A. And Parag, please in, inter inter interject at any stage if if we're missing obvious questions. If you know what I mean, like I just picked up there. Yeah. Uh, but in the any anything immediate, Parag, or will I move on? I'd say keep moving. Keep, Keep moving. Thank ask, you. We can ask questions as we go if people Thank prefer. You. Um, Thank you. So look at Shirley and Julie, and certainly my work would have been um, primarily on biodiversity uh, value of hedges, which you know we're we're extremely 
proud of and interested in the biodiversity of hedges without doubt but in recent years I think um, carbon has I won't say taken over but it's given hedges a new lease of life and that's all to the benefit from my point of view anyway I'm sure that sure the girls would agree um, so but and uh, but it's a whole new topic very very complicated compared to in my view anyway <laughs> compared to biodiversity so I, I I depend on my my colleague Lillian as the expert here but I, so before we get Lillian to talk about that, um, we shall ask Yvonne if you're ready there with just the introduction uh, video that Lillian prepared for us last year, and then she will give us an update on, on what's happening since and maybe go into the basics. Thank you, Yvonne. More research is needed to understand the carbon dynamics in hedges. Farm carbon is a research project co-funded by the Environmental Protection Agency and the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine. Lillian O'Sullivan, Johnstown Castle, explains. To estimate the carbon contained in hedgerows, we need to consider the different carbon pools. We need to think about the carbon that's contained in the biomass, so our above ground biomass that we can see but also the below ground biomass, because of course roots uh, can make up quite a substantial uh, proportion of biomass. We also need to think about the different organic matter returns into the system. So if there is dead wood or also if there's leaf litter that's uh, being lost uh, seasonally in the year, how much of that is going back into the system and cycled in uh, to the carbon pools. We also have to look at uh, the soil organic matter and consider the amount of carbon that's contained in the soil, particularly under hedgerows relative maybe to adjacent uh, land use. And also there is a need to understand the sequestration difference between managed and unmanaged hedgerows. So what we need to do is to explore uh, carbon in hedgerows, but also how carbon and biodiversity are related. Very often, I'm sure many of the uh, indicators or attributes that are good for biodiversity are also likely to be important for carbon. So, for example, things like your structure, the density of the hedgerow, the connectivity of the hedgerow, all of those attributes are important for biodiversity, but they too are likely to be important uh, for the carbon profile. And that's something we need to also look at. Now, Lillian, um, that was last year. Can you update us and yeah. perhaps even explain, go back to the very basics, because I know, if, you know, it is difficult for people to understand carbon and edges. Yeah, well, I suppose, Catherine, um, I typically generally tend to look at it as carbon is just another one of the potential benefits associated with hedgerows when we're thinking about um, their potential, uh, particularly in agricultural landscapes. Uh, but uh, the work of Stuart that we saw in the earlier video, um, this is essentially in many respects an extension and building on that work, because if we want to think about the role of hedgerows and, uh, and that within the, the land use carbon budgets, then there's a few things we need to, to be able to understand. Um, so of course, things like the extent, uh, the amount of carbon stored in the hedgerow, um, and the size of the hedgerow, so, you know, the width, height and the type, the extent and degree of management. But if we want to be able to do that, then we need to understand the typical amount of carbon that you have stored in a hedgerow. And it's not quite simply of just looking at it, but also really starting to understand those different pools uh, which are necessary uh, if we want to account for them. So uh, what we've done since that video was we've taken our, our samples and what we've had to do is separate out the samples into those different pools that we spoke about in the video. So uh, you're talking about your living biomass. So that's all the above ground biomass, but also that root biomass um, that needs to be thought about. Uh, we have our, our dead uh, our dead pool, which is, of course, um, that standing dead wood and also um, the very fine roots. But then to the litter that gets cycled back, that's considered part of the so-called um, um, dead pool. And then we also, of course, have that soil to be considered. So is there a carbon accrual effect uh, in soil under hedgerows relative to adjacent land use? So by now, 
we've we've done all of that field work. Uh, there's been a huge process in terms of um, sample preparation because we need to, um, of course, dry uh, all of the samples. So your your biomass, dry wood biomass. We know we have some estimates on that from published literature. Uh, the national uh, or the international literature has an estimate of as much as 55%, but research in the UK has Whitethorn at about 48% uh, percent of dry uh, biomass uh, as the carbon percentage. Um, so we're currently at the point where we're now pushing everything through the lab and then we'll be at a stage now in springtime to start the modelling associated um, with all of this work. But I suppose it's, um, it's not a simple process, but the earlier work that has been done by colleagues, um, you know, that gives us at least an estimate of the extent at national level. And we do already have some estimates of what that carbon sink potential might be. Um, but the earlier models were based whereby it was looking at trees uh, or at hedgerows almost as small trees and using some forestry models. Whereas this is the first time now where we've tried to characterize uh, the biomass and carbon in hedgerows uh, specifically and build a model related uh, to that. So, so that's currently where we're at uh, with, with that project and the work is ongoing. We hope to have uh, the lab work through now in spring and get the modeled uh, work done in the coming months. Thanks a million, Lillian. And I know there'll be questions we'll, which we'll come back to later on that. Um, now we're going to move on just on the, when we're talking about management, the, before we come to the Hedgling Association of Ireland and Mark McDowell, we shall show a video so that people are clear what we're talking about when we're talking about Hedgling, um, a video done by a member of the Hedgling Association of Ireland, Owen Donnelly, uh, last year. So thank you, uh, Yvonne, when you're ready. The ideal hedgerow for rejuvenation is an escaped hedgerow. One which has grown up and got thin at the base, but there are still approximately one stem every metre or so. Owen Donnelly from the Hedge Laying Association of Ireland is showing here how to lay a hedge correctly. What we're doing here is cutting the, the hedge at the base and we're trying to make the cuts as low to the ground as possible. So you always lay a hedge uphill. So the what we call the pleachers, the stems, are cut and laid to, at an angle of 45 degrees running up the slope. This is to um, get a better transpiration of moisture so the sap rises and the hedge remains living. When you've got it down, sometimes you've got pieces that stick up. You can make cuts in the hedge higher up to flex the hedge into the shape you want and then they're woven in. It's actually rolled back slightly from the ground cuts and this is to allow light to get into the hedge and for the hedge to rejuvenate and reshoot up along the face. So you want to expose these cuts to the sunlight to get maximum regeneration. The great difference between obviously between coppicing a hedge and laying a hedge is that you're retaining the hedge um, it's a living entity, you get a rejuvenated hedge from the base but you've got a living platform for birds to nest in. Because they're attached to the hinge, they'll still flower, they'll still bear fruit. Things like thrushes, blackbirds, robins to nest in. Dunnocks, a little hedge sparrow, likes to nest in the base of these hedges. Having a, a tree in the hedgerow provides a uh, song perch for birds and if you can leave whitethorn or blackthorn uh, crab apple, so on the flowering species, they're also good for the pollinators. This is known as a galog, which is a pin that holds the hedge down. If it's a windy site, you don't want it rocking around. It's a, it's a skill and an art to do it, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's the best thing you can do to a hedge. Now, so over to Mark McDowell, tell us about the Hedge Laying Association of Ireland and your thoughts on the state of Ireland's hedgerows. Thanks, Catherine. Good morning. Um, the Hedge Laying Association of Ireland was founded in 2004 by a group of people who realized that there were serious issues in hedgerow management in Ireland. The main um, objectives of the association were to encourage and facilitate 
the conservation, protection, and appropriate management of hedgerows, and uh, to facilitate landowners in the management of hedgerows by hedge laying, as Owen just described, where appropriate. Also to establish, maintain, and promote recognized standards of craftsmanship in hedge laying and uh, also to provide training. Now, this has been an issue over the years, and uh, I'll go straight to the agri-environment schemes, which have been in place now for, is it over 20 years? Very well intentioned at the start with reps and the first rep schemes, but overall, um, we have to say, and as Shirley's evidence there earlier on, pointed out, we've had 20 years of these schemes and the state of our hedges has disimproved. Um, whatever evidence we have shows that. Um, and this it goes back to the, what we were, as I was saying there about applying standards and promoting standards in hedgerow management. There is a, a basic lack of understanding in the schemes, uh, in, in those who draw them up, they are trying to make them as easily applicable uh, to be carried out by those taking part in the schemes. But the upshot is that they have been a disaster for our hedgerows. Um, they are the uh, hedgerow elements of the schemes have been drawn up by people who don't seem to grasp the nature of hedge laying and hedgerow management. Hedge laying is a system that has to be carried out on a farm. It's not something that you sign up for for a couple of years and then your hedges are laid and then you never bother with them again. If you have a thousand meters of hedge on a farm, ideally you will lay 50 to 100 meters annually. This preserves the habitats in the remaining 90% of the, of the hedge and provides um, space for the birds to continue nesting because hedge laying, as you probably saw in Owen's video, is quite an invasive form of management. It reduces the volume of the hedge considerably initially, but it extends the life of the hedge indefinitely. So you move along the hedge, uh, doing about 10% of it <clears throat> every year. And uh, by the time you're finished, the bit you laid at the beginning is, uh, is ready to be laid again. And it is an ongoing system. The, uh, the agri-environment schemes have failed to recognize that. In fact, they have actually actively discouraged that. And that is quite shocking. Um, but there is hope for the future because hedgerows, as the association has been saying to the powers that be for since our inception, are vital for biodiversity. We even were mentioning carbon sequestration back around 2010 um, to, as, as, as a, a, a huge service provided by our hedgerows. Um, so as biodiversity is ticking all the boxes in Europe and the funding and car carbon sequestration is uh, also uh, top of everyone's agenda, but it doesn't change the actual basic need that all hedgerows have for management. Now, it may mean if you are to increase the volume and uh, the, the overall uh, biomass of a hedge that you change the cutting regime so that you allow it to become broader at the, at the base and, and to grow out into the fields, you allow it to grow taller. But ultimately that hedge wants to become and will become a row of trees unless it is managed by people who know what they are doing. And that is um, ideally hedge laying, but so many of our, our um, hedgerows are now completely overgrown um, that they would need, in order to restore them, um, they would need to be coppiced. Uh, coppicing is cutting the tree down completely to about two to three inches off the ground, um, clearing out the 
the other biomass, brambles, nettles, cleavers that will be on the banks and seeing what is there, what is left when you do that. Now, most likely in a big overgrown hedge, you will have probably one tree per meter. And so then you have your one stump per meter and between those two stumps, you plant five or six new whips. And uh, again, a hugely invasive process, which will, um, which will uh, ultimately benefit the hedge enormously. But on account of it being so invasive, you do no more than 5% of the hedge annually. And that is a huge thing with, with the schemes that you just do a small amount of your hedges and work your way around. And we have okay, that video. Thanks, Mark. Catherine. Thank you very much, Mark. And we have that video on the, the coppicing. So just to be clear, rejuvenating, which has been and please God will be in the schemes and done right, is fantastic, as, as Mark said. So we just to, for clarity, we're going to show the hedge coppicing now by Yvonne. The most important thing is to get the you know the, the cuts as low to the ground as possible. The individual uh, stems have grown up, um, become mature trees, single stems um, with lots of gaps in between, not stop proof, uh, thin at the base basically. And that can very successfully be rejuvenated. Um, Owen Donnelly from the Hedgerow Association of Ireland will demonstrate um, how coppicing is carried out correctly. The most important thing is to get the, you know, the, the cuts as low to the ground as possible, but not right into the soil. Cutting it down to the ground like this, where we have the stumps right down at two to three inches, they'll reshoot and you're, within the first year we'll probably get four to six feet of regeneration. A, a machine can come in, you can take the hedge row off the bank or the ditch using a machine, but he won't cut the hedge low enough. So you need to go back in afterwards and clear out all the um, uh, ground cover. And this can be done with a, a slash hook like I have here. You need to get it cleaned out so you can see if there's any wire or stones. And then once you've, you're down and got a, a, a clean base to work on, then you can reduce uh, what the machine has left to um, two to three inches. And you can see the stones. So if you're using a chainsaw, you know, you're not cutting blind into weeds and so on. But the important thing then is to protect the hedge and to protect the margin, the verge to the hedge. So a fence on both sides if you've got cattle. Um, leave um, specimen trees or standard trees in the hedgerow. So because you, you can see behind me there's a, a singled out ash of a single stem, um, which are is a good tree for songbirds. So nesting birds in the hedge require a higher perch so they can sit up um, and sing out their territory. But also it's important to leave flowering plants in the, and this is for the um, pollinators. We're looking to regenerate it to produce a habitat that's um, all inclusive for ground flora and fauna. Thank you, um, Yvonne, there for the video. And um, we shall now come to Alan Moore. So Alan, will you tell us about Hedgerows Ireland and your thoughts on the state of Ireland's hedgerows? Yeah, thank you, Catherine. Good morning. Um, hedgerows Ireland is a fairly new national lobby group comprising landowners and people interested in the environment. And I think it's fair to say our position on the current situation is a mixture of real hope for the future of hedgerows, countered by the reality of the continuing vulnerability of our existing hedgerows. Hedgerows are really important for our wildlife and for addressing climate change, as we've heard already. When it comes to wildlife, their importance cannot be overestimated. There was a series of Guinness ads a few years ago with the strap line about a pint of Guinness being alive inside, and that really does apply to our hedges too. Two thirds of our bird species either feed or nest or both in hedges, which are also home to over 600 of our flowering plants and a huge range of insects and pollinators that depend on both the flowering hedge shrubs like whitethorn, as well as the flowering plants that grow alongside the hedge itself. Our group sometimes refers to our hedgerows as being the Irish equivalent of the Amazonian rainforests. 
and they are just as vulnerable to destruction as I'll come to in a minute. In the last few years, and I think it's no coincidence that this has been during COVID and lockdown, there's been an explosion of public interest in our countryside. People walking the roads, foraging for blackberries, elderflower, elderberries, bird watching, plant spotting, and so on. And a lot of this interest has been in hedgerows. People really like hedgerows. But all this, as we've heard, has been matched by a growing scientific appreciation of what hedgerows can do for carbon, both above and below ground, as we've heard earlier. And the science is telling us, not surprisingly, that when it comes to carbon, bigger, taller, wider hedges are better, just as these kind of hedges are better for wildlife. Again, exact figures on carbon capture will soon be available. But we think we should be using this knowledge wisely now so our group is submitting a detailed proposal to the CAP consultation process that's about to close to ensure that some measure of hedgerow quality and size is included in the new eco schemes relating to existing hedgerows. There's lots of good stuff in the draft proposals about planting new hedges and trees, but nothing yet about the management of our existing 700,000 kilometers of hedgerows. This is a real lost opportunity. The technique uh, in recent years for annual very severe cutting means that a lot of the potential of our hedgerows for both carbon and wildlife is being lost, and we've heard that already. We think that changing this needs to be incentivized in the new cap. We also think that the reintroduction of regional hedge cutting, and not just hedge cutting, but hedge management courses uh, and certification will be really important too. Knowledge is key here. It's a potential growth area with jobs. On the question of vulnerability to removal, there is no polite way of saying this. The regulations around hedgerow removal are crazy. You, for example, can remove up to 500 meters of hedgerow without needing to alert the Department of Agriculture. And if you intend to remove more than that amount or create a field bigger than five hectares, there's a 95% chance that the department will give you the go ahead. In the southeast, the figure is up to 98%. So this means uh, that hundreds, thousands of kilometers have been removed legally in recent years, and that only accounts for the amount applied for. The true figure is, is enormous, as we've heard. To put this in some perspective, in the UK, uh, it's illegal to remove more than 20 meters of hedge without approval. As a result, we are seeing more and more 100 acre fields appearing in our countryside with all the loss of habitat that goes with that. When it comes to tillage, I think we all understand that big machines need big fields, but surely not 100 acre prairies. Is that really necessary? And it's not just habitat that's being lost, shelter and shade for livestock, flood control, increasingly topical, soil filtration, and of course the sheer beauty of the, a network of connected hedges that gives to a landscape as opposed to a bleak desert. So I'd love some feedback in the chat about this. It would be very interesting. Uh, Podrick, I'll wrap up now on that campaigning note, but if people are interested in what we're doing, uh, please visit us on hedgerowsireland.org and you'll find our email address on that website. Thanks, Yvonne. Thanks, Podrick. Thank you very much, Alan. And just before I hand over to Parag for the questions, just a reminder, please put in comments and questions into the Q&A. Um, this uh, session is being recorded and will be available uh, later on. And um, because there's a few people asking about, the, especially the detail, uh, Shirley and Julie's uh, facts and figures, we, we deliberately keep, keep, are keeping this to a panel discussion rather than asking them for um, a presentation. But Shirley's uh, the hedgerow report from Monaghan will be, it's hot off the press and will be available on the Monaghan County Council website and will be straight up on this website um, as soon as uh, it's publicly available. And uh, Julie has a paper as well, which I shall put on our website. So everything, uh, any additions to today's, if anybody, um, including the websites there for from Alan and Mark, and any updates from Lillian. So we shall keep this uh, where you logged on here. There will be the detailed information as well as the opportunity to look back on this. Um, but I think we've lots of questions coming in. So I shall um, invite Parig to. 
come and uh, take over and see what came up in the quest in the quest chat. Lots and lots came up in the chat um, and lots of compliments and um, lots of people looking for presentations. Generally, it's death by PowerPoint um, and people like to avoid it. And I think we've done a great job of avoiding it. It's been a very interesting discussion. I, for one, have definitely learned a lot. Um, hedges are generally something I get stuck in. And um, so it's been, been interesting this morning. And fair play to the panelists. You've answered a lot of questions directly to people. Um, but generally, I find if people have asked a question, there's more than one person out there thinking it. So I'm going to go back through the questions that you've already answered, if that's OK. Um, and the first one I'm going to put to Julie, who hasn't got her camera turned on. Um, and the rest of you, if you've got uh, anything to comment on it, please shout as well. Hi, Julie. Um, lots of questions came in about noxious weeds, guys. Um, everybody, well, nearly everybody mentioned them. Um, why are nettles a problem? Are they a noxious weed? Tell me more about noxious weeds. Um, how do you avoid noxious weeds? How do you treat them without herbicides? So Julie, if you want to kick off with that one, that'd be great. I suppose noxious weeds in the technical sense are those weeds that were um, put out by the government back in the thirties or something like thistles and dock and ragwort that would have, they'd reduce the forage quality of, um, of hay and silage and things like that so they and then ragwort of course obviously has um implications for livestock if they eat it it can be poisonous but i suppose we kind of put noxious weeds and ruddle species kind of in the same whereas nettles aren't technically noxious weeds i would class them more as ruddle species so ruddle species would be species that when you give them a lot of nutrients they grow really fast and really tall at the expense of our other smaller low grown wildflower species like our primrose or our violets and things like that so i would say nettles thistles cleavers they grow really well in a high nutrient environment like i said at the expense of our smaller wildflower species and that's why we say that there are other, those rudder species need to be um need to be controlled but i think it is probably our fault that we do say noxious weeds and rudder species kind of in the same in the same vein when I suppose technically we should we should be defining them as two separate things like so that would probably I'd say could be where a lot of the confusion is coming from with um, regards to that and of course obviously nettles do nettles thistles they do have a good biodiversity value but not when you've got a monoculture or a big sword of nettles and thistles, like I said, again, at the expense of our other smaller native wildflower species. So hopefully that's answered high, something. Yeah, definitely answered it there. You mentioned high nutrient, high nutrient environment. You said it better than me. Um, mm -hmm. Is that is that part of the problem? Is fertilizer and slurry by the by the headlands a problem? Yeah, yeah, definitely it is like um, so it's it's a lot of a lot of nutrients from the slurry the fertilizer application that's getting into the the base of a hedgerow and it's just allowing these species that thrive so well um, in high nutrient environments take hold um, and it's even things like cutting the hedgerow if you've got allow your cuttings to fall down into the base of the hedgerow that can add uh, extra nutrients to the base of the hedgerow um, and if you're even if you're cutting your your thistles and you're cutting your nettles without removing them as well that can add more more nutrients to the area so it is it's it is it's it's kind of a um, a, a complicated uh, bit of a process all right but it is yeah would there be farmers out there julie that actually go along with a hedge cutter cut their hedge and then remove everything no no sure no, I, I don't do. think so like but it, it's just all it's, it's all pragmatic to do it in any situation is it pardon say that again would it be pragmatic to do that in any situation <laughs> well if you want to reduce your ruderal species yes but it's not it's not, it's not viable, i suppose yeah yeah not not practical yeah yeah so. Okay, and from a biodiversity point of view, I guess, and one of the other questions is what, how do you recommend removing them from the hedgerow without the use of her herbicides and obviously slaughtering I was, in the meantime? The, the only way, I suppose, would be to, to cut them and then allow a little bit of grazing to the base of the hedgerow, but not too much that they're, they're getting, that the cattle are getting into the hedgerow itself. Like if you keep the sward low, um, you'll allow your smaller wildflower species to thrive um, at the base of the hedgerow. So it's, it's just these taller fast growing species that are detrimental to our, our wildflower species that our bees and our pollinators will, will thrive on. So. Okay, Shirley, I'll move on to you uh, for a quick question just on, on the figures of newly planted hedges. You probably have some values there that you, you could go through again. There was a lot of questions on the stats that you had given. Um, so maybe just a quick refresher on, on the, the volume of newly planted hedges, if you could. Hi, Porig. <clears throat> Sorry, I'll have to go through the report to find the exact figure on it and I'll send it on to you. Um, 
I'm not going to be able to do that. I have 100 and something pages here. But um, just to say that there is an increase in mono species hedges in the county in the report. So for new hedges that have been planted with just one single species, we have an increase in that. And just following on from what Julie's been saying there about, you know, managing the base of hedges. Um, I think part of the problem is, is that farmers are not being paid for the quality of the hedges that they produce. So, you know, if a farmer could be paid for the results of a decent hedge, maybe that's been grazed at the correct time of year so that we have a good species rich at the base, that's been managed correctly over time with the hedge laying, you know, management for the shrub species and the other tree species being kept. You know, so if they were, man if they were being incentivized for results, not incentivized for management or for how many times they cut a hedge, but for results. So what I would really like to recommend, and I think you know, that we should say something you know, um, positive from the point of view of what we should recommend. And I think we do need to have a results-based payment scheme for that includes hedges and includes them as part of a package that farmers can access um, to actually include them as a proper um, biodiversity and livestock resource for their farm. Um, around here, the, one of the big problems is that the hedges have been cut to just into a box shape, very low to the ground, not even a meter in height, a lot of them. And they've been cut every single year. And I mean, that's an investment going into them in the sense that they're going out and cutting them. So that is an investment of time and machinery and diesel and all sorts of things. But the result of the, the quality of the hedge has not been assessed in any way. And the results that we're presenting today, it's more than just a set of figures. It's a picture, if you visualize it in your mind, of a gradual decrease in the quality of our landscape and a gradual decrease over time that then becomes something, the snapshot then becomes something real. It means that we're losing all these flood control capacities of our hedges. We're losing their nutrient absorption capacity for you know, a decent amount of or a sensible amount of fertilizer or slurry because they can no longer function as that. And um, we're actually, you know, I just wanted to say somebody needed to say a results based payment scheme for hedgerows because I really think we need one. I think that's a message coming across loud and clear from all speakers <laughs> today. Um, it, just a quick question on the value of shorter, smaller hedges, say, in urban areas, if you wouldn't mind, Shirley. Um, say 50 to 100 metres. It's a question that's come in a couple of times. Just uh, rather absolutely. Than going, yeah, work away. Valuable. Yeah, of course they're valuable. I think, I think, I think, I think Declan Duke did a survey on urban hedges years ago in the Fingal area, which showed that they were extremely important in urban areas. Obviously, you know, for all of the same functions that they're valuable for in a rural setting, um, biodiversity, um, air quality, you know, carbon sequestration. Of course, they can function for all of those things. So, absolutely, I would encourage diverse hedgerows being planted in urban areas and the maintenance of those that are already present. Excellent. Thanks, Shirley. Lillian, a uh, question you've already answered there around the legality of cutting down hedges or illegal element of cutting down hedges. Alan already touched on this, but maybe you might just give uh, people a refresher on it again. Yeah, well, in, of course, hedgerows are protected under the Wildlife Act. And of course, there's also a lot of guidelines around uh, the management and when they can and cannot be cut, of course, associated with the um, uh, bird nesting season, etc. So, um, whilst um, Alan you know highlighted that there are a lot of caveats with respect to uh, permissibility to remove hedgerows and um, it's also the case that one should already have that uh, same amount replanted elsewhere on the the farming platform itself so it's not uh, the case that it is a, a carte blanche however um, it, it is the case that we have also seen that there has been a decline even with some of the remote technologies Technologies that we have been um, exploring from the carbon uh, point of view. Now, some of the newly planted ones wouldn't be uh, picked up on that. There are guidelines around it, but the lengths, uh, as Alan points out, do uh, mean, of course, that there's a lot of hedgerows that can be legally uh, removed and may fall below thresholds uh, for uh, EIAs. But of course, you know, you would certainly need uh, to take a look at the environmental impact if you are going to be um, doing any hedgerow removals. But there are guidelines around that. And um, that's not to say that um, 
the evidence doesn't support entirely, um, uh, I suppose, the efficacy entirely of some of that legislation. Okay, okay. And you know? just um, a question here, why is beech and non-native species such a popular choice for hedgerows? And maybe, Mark, you might like to comment on that as well. Um, I, I think you, you get back into uh, just the science of it. Um, beach doesn't um, isn't a native because it's not it's it's not classified as a native because um, its its presence in in the pollen record is is lacking. I, I think that's all. I mean, it, it thrives here. It does very you know it, it it's been here for an awfully long time, but it's just not classified as a native. It's not a it, it's not a, a it's a, a popular choice. Really. So it mm -hmm. if, if if filling in gaps in a hedge, is it better to put in one or two quick growing species, or try for diverse flora from the start? Um, filling in gaps in a hedge is an art in itself. Uh, the whole business of managing is is uh, an art in itself. If you have a gap in a well established hedge, don't just put in little whips, little single growing, single stems, because they, they'll get shaded out, they, they'll, they can't thrive, they can't compete for the nutrients that are available if, if, there are, if there's an established hedge around them. The ideal thing to do is if you have hedgerows on the farm and you're aware of, um, of, of gaps in them, you set up a little system. Get your whips, get maybe 50 or 60 whips, put them in buckets, Plant, the, plant them in buckets, and when you plant them in, cut them back to two or three inches. Um, the following spring, they will have five or six little stems will have grown off what you cut back. Keep them for a couple of years, cutting them back every year. So two or three years, what you have in each bucket is a proper little <clears throat> shrub. Plant that into a gap, and it can hold its own. And that's that's actually how, how to fill gaps. There is the other business of layering, where you lay a stem, put it across the gap, a lot flat along the ground, and you can put sods over, the, over the, the stem where it's on the ground. And there's a good chance that it will root there and new growth will come off that. Um, but ideally, just if you have hedges and you have gaps, have a little supply of shrubs, small trees that are ready to be Put into those gaps and can hold their own. Okay, very detailed answer. Thank you. And um, why is it important to change hedgerow, hedgerows to a hedge laying system? Now, maybe that's a misunderstanding of the, the full presentation. Does everything need to change to that? That that is that's a misunderstanding because hedge laying. I if I go to any hedge, I was out in one in Kildare last week. Um, it's at this stage, it's been flailed and it's over. It, it's it's over managed, but the whole base of the hedge. It's perfectly clear that it was laid properly 50 years ago. Proper stems. Hedge laying was quite common. I, it's very, it's more unusual to go to an old hedge and not find evidence that it was laid at some stage in the past um, than, to, than to find an, an unmanaged old hedge. Um, so it's really a return to that system of management. Um, and that the... It, it keeps them alive indefinitely. And that is, is why they were managed that way. Um, and, you know, they predate the wire for stock proof efficiency. They also then provide the shelter and the various um, services uh, regarding the, the flood management and nutrients, retaining nutrients in the soil and uh, all, all the various things. But yeah, no, it, it is, it be a return to the system. Absolutely, services that we'll all be glad of when we uh, get this orange and yellow warning coming for tomorrow night. Absolutely, um, Alan. Uh, should hedges bordering native woodland schemes scheme versus livestock containment be managed as intensively as described uh, with with hedge laying? Or is that are you putting it to me, Padre? I am. Yeah. 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 No, I mean it may not be for me, but I want to just uh, quickly make a separate point and then maybe hand over to somebody on, on that more detailed question, because I think that the big point that maybe we haven't stressed is that time is not on our side in relation to the carbon and biodiversity goals that we're, we're trying to meet. And it's it's well established that a new hedge takes between 20 and 50 
years to reach biodiversity or carbon equivalents. Uh, so we just don't have the time on our hands to be in planting new hedges is great, uh, as long as they are multi species and they, they tick all the boxes. But I think Shirley made the point very clearly that we need to be addressing the management of our existing 700,000 kilometers. There's just a vast potential there that is being mismanaged. And you know we could do so much with small changes in management practice. So the, the clock is ticking. For your question about planting near uh, woodlands, I, I think I'll bounce to somebody uh, who's perhaps better qualified. We, we to might answer. bring Mark back into the fold then again. Say that to me again. We might bring Mark back into the fold again, just for the hedges bordering bordering native woodland scheme versus livestock containment. Should it be managed differently? I guess there's different, obviously, biodiversity opportunities on both sides of that hedge. Um, uh, no, I I would uh, I I would recommend managing them, the, managing the hedge in such a way that it that it thrives. Now, if it's going to be shaded by the woodland. Um, maybe different different cutting, but otherwise, um, no. I, 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 as far as I'm aware, there's no okay. particular need to mention differently, un unless someone can tell me that there is. Um, I'm, yeah. I'm not aware of it. Can I, 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 we'll move on to another question then uh, on, in relation to ash dieback? I guess there's a couple of questions in there, um, just about the, the the risk that it can cause from creating gaps in hedges. Um, obviously, trees are going to fall. There's health risks around them. Um, anyone care to comment on that? Um, I'll, I'll comment a little bit if you want. Um, in our survey, I, as I said, we've obviously it's seventy percent of the tree species in our hedges in Monaghan are ash, and um, of the trees that we surveyed, or all the trees that we looked at, and we examined them for um, signs of ash dieback, and ninety percent of the ash trees in our survey. Are demonstrating that they have ash dieback. So I know that um, I we had a presentation as heritage officers some time ago about ash dieback from an expert, and I think there is a huge um, issue being stored up in our countryside that we're not really addressing at the moment. You know, if you know that number of trees in Monaghan's hedges are there, obviously they're going to possibly probably die. Um, what tree species are we going to plant instead? Um, how are we going to manage our hedges? Um, from the point of view of road safety, it's going to be an issue. It's going to be store increasing storms, possibly unstable trees and hedges. Then we're going to have issues where people are going to panic and are going to cut trees before they're needed to be cut. You know, and there's, there's all of these things that we haven't actually really discussed as far as I can see. And so there's issues here for you know local authorities, for landowners, um, and for the future biodiversity, richness and carbon storage potential um, present and future of our hedges and it's all tied into climate and biodiversity and uh, I think we need a serious discussion on some urgent um, recommendations and incentives actually to do something about this um, and that's what I would say. Thanks Shirley and um, you mentioned road safety in, in your comment there and that's something that has come back again that uh, road safety is being used as an excuse to cut back hedges to uh, an alarming degree. Is there, I don't know, how, how can that be tackled or have you got any, any comments on or views on it? Well, I think, yeah, I would agree. I think certainly um, it has been used. It's certainly been used as, an ex as a, well, it's potentially been used as a reason to cut hedges down extremely low. I mean, road safety doesn't necessarily require that your hedge is now like two, two foot off the ground. You know what I mean? Um, they're being, ex they're being in, in, increasingly intensively managed um, to a very high degree. Uh, obviously road safety is very important. I think we need better mm -hmm. guidelines better training um, on what machinery to use, how to go about it. And obviously, I think even additional road calming measures that don't involve necessarily attacking our biodiversity every time a health and safety issue is raised. And that maybe there are other road safety considerations that could be put in place in some areas. I think that there's a difference between, you know, hedgerows that could be classified as heritage hedgerows, but town dry, town land boundary hedgerows, which are more species rich. And you know, hedgerows adjacent to native woodlands, which should definitely be managed better. Um, the regulations that are in place for hedgerows at the moment, and um, the Wildlife Act, for example, doesn't even call them hedgerows. And you know, it refers to um, vegetation in a ditch or something, you know. So I think there's a whole load of things there that need to be addressed quite urgently. 
And we're always talking about addressing them, but we really haven't done enough to date. I'm, I'm being pushed. I've getting numerous messages here on time, but because we have 218 people still online, they're obviously interested in, in what we've got to talk about. So very quickly, I'm going to go to Ichi for a comment, um, more so than answering a, a specific question. Um, if you got one message that you want pushed throughout this week, what would it be? And Alan, I'll go to you first. Charlie, we'll come back to you last because you've, you've um, spoken last. To me first. Yeah, thanks, Brody. <clears throat> I mean, I think the, the big message from us is there's huge potential here. We still have the matrix, the network of our hedgerows largely intact, despite all the removal that we've seen. We need to exploit that. We need to make the most of it. Hedgerows tick all the boxes for carbon, for biodiversity, and so on. We'd like to see the new CAP doing much more to reflect that. Mm -hmm. uh, the new REAP scheme will feed into uh, the Pillar 2 payments, but we think the uh, the, the CAP scheme should be much more uh, ambitious and harness the potential that is waiting to be harnessed. Perfect. Lillian, 30 seconds. Uh, similar sentiments. Uh, absolutely. There's, uh, we've heard a lot maybe about what's perhaps the negatives to some extent, but I think the take home message really should be that there are a lot of positives here and there's a lot of opportunity uh, that could be exploited. And there are ways that we should be better supporting landowners, farmers, uh, not only for biodiversity, but carbon, but also some of the other multiple benefits we heard about this morning. Yeah, and I, just to echo that, the picture in the background, I think of your screen and mine says it all, there's lots of hedgerows in there. And I think farmers need to not be penalized for managing the hedgerows and perhaps even letting them grow a little wider than they currently are. Mark, 30 seconds, if you wouldn't mind. Um, uh, what I would, and um, we have been looking for for years, is the application, the serious application of standards in professional hedgerow management um, uh, at an official level, so that the hedges that are chosen in schemes uh, for the laying option or, or coppicing are chosen by people who know what they're talking about, who know what, what is suitable, and that the work is carried out by people who know what they're doing and inspected by people who know what's meant to have happened. There are no standards applied at official level. It's quite shocking. Okay, okay. Hard to believe. Julie, we'll bring you back in um, for a, a quick comment, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, I think it's going to mirror what everybody else is saying, just to highlight the quality and the, the importance of our hedgerows around the country. Um, I think for... Uh, uh, Ireland in the EU, we're the country with the least amount of wooded area, and the wood that we do have is all up and up. And the are above and above and above and above. We're, we're losing you there. I think your mic, your mic might have let you down, but if, if you're mirror, mirroring what everyone else is saying, we'll, yeah. we'll go with that. Thanks Pretty very much. much yeah. And yeah. early, last but not least, and before you um, pop in there. We have a comment, just hope biodiversity at the base of fences will be covered later in the week. So Catherine, you can keep that in mind. Shirley, take it away. Um, thanks. Yeah, I just want to say that um, hedgerows connect us and our landscape together. They're a very cultural, if culturally important resource in Ireland, as well as an ecologically important resource. And I've presented some very stark figures there today. But I wanted to say that, I mean, just like the other speakers, that it's the infrastructure that is there in place at the moment and it can be improved. And there's a huge opportunity to improve it for biodiversity, for climate and for agricultural, I would say, productivity and for, you know, the, the shelter and shade of livestock and all of those types of benefits. So I would really encourage farmers to maybe come together and think about how we could actually operate results based payment schemes for landowners that include hedges. And I know the Bride Project, I think, had some work done on this down in the south of the county or the country. And um, I say, let's build on this opportunity, but let's not say that things positive and rosy in the garden because it's not. We have a lot of hard work to do and I think that we should do it. Okay, Catherine, I I'll hand it back to you and just to thank everybody for the numerous questions that were sent in and apologies, we, we didn't get to them all. We could knock another half an hour or an hour out of this. Thanks very much, folks. Um, Paul, just one comment on the, the questions there for the people who want to plant beech, maybe around houses and that. Can I put in a plug for holly? Native keeps its leaves during the year. Just a, a suggestion. I'd love to see that expanded. Uh, we're, don't forget, we're following up tomorrow with biodiversity. And I remember the base of the hedge park um, biodiversity from hedges. Um, and then on to the critical point of management on Wednesday, which I think today is given as the basis for that. 
and um, and the, the biodiversity then the different requirements um, of of different uh, you know every every different things want different things out of hedges and that's fine we need to understand them all and then um, a lovely session on Thursday on the food from hedges which uh, you know again is another value that is attracting people so listen and uh, thank you so much to the uh, expert panelists today uh, thank you to Parig. And thank you particularly to Yvonne for keeping us right today. Um, otherwise we wouldn't we wouldn't be here. So see you all tomorrow. Um, same time, same link, uh, or join on the link. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.